Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on the Fantasy Football Fix YouTube channel. In this video, I'll be going through my transfer targets ahead of what might possibly be a double game week 23. If you are enjoying the content here on this channel, please do remember to like, comment and subscribe. But without further ado, let's jump into today's video. So as I said at the start, there is a possibility of a double game week in game week 23. There are a few teams that could potentially double, but the team look like that look like they are most likely to double if anyone does is Aston Villa. And therefore, the majority of the players suggested in today's video are Aston Villa players. Now, the great thing about Aston Villa is that even if they don't have a double in 23, they have fantastic fixtures from game week 23 to game week 28. And they do have two games to be rearranged at some point. If they're rearranged in 23 to 28, absolutely fantastic. If they're rearranged after that, it means not only can you keep them between 23 and 28, you can also keep them slightly more long term. Potentially, if there's a double game, we can game it 33 or 34. And then there looks like there'll be a big one in 36 as well. So realistically, you can probably hold those Aston Villa players if you don't want to sell them for the, for the remainder of the season or at the very, very least, the next six to eight fixtures, which is absolutely fantastic. Aston Villa at the moment, like I said, only have a single game in game week 23 against Everton away, but they do have two fixtures to be rearranged. Those are Leeds away and Burnley at home. And there's a relatively high chance that there is the possibility that this could be a rearranged into game week 23. There is a free slot available in the FA Cup weekend, and therefore these fixtures could technically be put into that game week. They could also just about be put into game week 24 if they move the game week 24 deadline and move it earlier. So there's a few possibilities that these fixtures will be rearranged in weeks in the upcoming future. However, for the time being, let's just assume that they only have the single game week fixtures, but just bear in mind that they could quite easily, maybe at the time of you watching this, they might have a double game week in 23, either Everton away and Leeds away, or Everton away and Burnley at home. Either way, that would be a fantastic double game week. With respect to their actual fixtures, their single game week fixtures, they've got Everton away, Leeds at home, Newcastle away, Watford at home. I mean, those four fixtures are absolutely incredible. Brighton away is not a great fixture from an attacking perspective, but when we're looking at defenders here, Matty Cash and Luca Dean, they're not bad fixtures at all, Brighton away. Brighton don't tend to score that many goals. And there's Southampton away in game week 28. The first two players to compare here, and like I said, the majority of players in today's video are going to be Aston Villa players, is Matty Cash and Luca Dean. Now, I think it's very, very tricky to try and compare these two players mainly because we don't know how nailed Luca Dean is and how he will function in this Steven Gerrard team. Obviously, previously, they've been playing Matty Target at left back, occasionally Ashley Young as well. We assume that Luca Dean will come in and be the first choice left back. That is the assumption made just due to him having a much higher talent than, Luke, uh, than Target. The fact that they've splashed the cash on Luca Dean would suggest that they lo are looking to replace Target long term. But I don't know whether that will be immediate. I don't know whether Target will potentially maybe be rotated with the slightly easier fixtures. Might we see him come in for Newcastle or Watford? If so, that massively reduces the appeal of Luca Dean. So it is difficult. And this is where it will have to come down to you as a manager, what your interpretation of this is. I do think Luca Dean will play 95% of minutes. But I do think that there is slightly more competition for Dean than there is for Matty Cash. And therefore, that is 1-0 to Matty Cash in this case, in that I just think he's completely nailed in that right wing back slot and therefore that I think that's maybe one slight advantage to his bow. If we take a look at their underlying statistics, they are fairly comparable. The only thing I would say again is Luca Dean has been playing at Everton. So take all of these with a pinch of salt, but it gives you a bit of an idea about what you can achieve from an attacking sense. And I would argue that he's probably got more freedom at Aston Villa and therefore he might even be able to build on these underlying statistics. So with respect to minutes played, Cash has played almost every minute this season. Luca Dean's played a decent amount of minutes at 1,200. Does pick up the odd injury and the odd suspension as well. So you do have to watch out for that. But generally speaking, I think most of the, these two will play the majority of the minutes for the remainder of the season projected points wise it's difficult to compare because he's just moved to Aston Villa and the fantasy football fix algorithm hasn't caught up to the fact that he's probably nailed on in that left back spot so they've got his expected minutes quite low due to Matty Target still being in the projected 11 but that is one to keep up your eye on and maybe monitor in a few days expected FPL points per 90 pretty poor for both to be honest and this is due to the underlying data for both teams being pretty poor 2.97 expected FPL points for Matty Cash. Luca Dean is 1.93. Like I said, it is difficult to compare the two, specifically the fact that Luca Dean has been playing at Everton, but that is, again, something worth monitoring. Their non-penalty expected goals and expected assists are identical, 0.13 for the both of them. Matty Cash has 0.5 expected goals and 0.8 expected assists. Luca Dean is 0.3 expected goals and 0.1, I should say, expected assist. Therefore, they are both more creative than they are a goal threat, as you would expect from fullbacks. However, 
Cash has a slightly higher goal threat and Dina has a higher expected assist creativity threat. So that is something worth monitoring. We would prefer goals. You get more bonus points for goals. You also get more outright points for goals as well. So we would prefer those goals. So that might make you lean to Cash slightly. But again, it would be very interesting to see how they both function when they're playing together in the Aston Villa team. Big chances per 90. They've had zero. They've had no big chances this season. Again, they play very, very wide. As you can see by their touch maps, they are your classic wing backs. They play very, very wide. They hug the touch line and they're going to get in those early crosses, potentially drive towards the byline. They're going to get very, very limited goal threat, potential big chances in the box, which isn't a massive issue. But again, when you're looking at defenders that you want, the likes of Cancelo and Alonso, who do get the occasional big chance, that is really what you're going for with these defenders. And then touches in the box. This does massively favor cash at 2.87 versus Dean's 1.36. But what I would say is, again, I think that is the result of the Aston Villa, potentially the Aston Villa lineup and the Aston Villa formation and the philosophy that Gerald has brought in rather than potentially Cash being a more attacking fullback than Dean. But again, this is a lot of hypothesizing. It's pretty difficult to make this decision. The final thing to note is that Aston Villa's defensive data isn't fantastic. Now, there is a lot of theorizing out there that Gerard has made Aston Villa a tighter defense. And I would say, generally speaking, they look a more structured team and they look like they're following a philosophy of sort rather than what we saw under Dean Smith at the end, which looked like complete chaos. And they didn't really look like they knew what they were doing at the back or going forward as well. I would say that they generally look like a tighter unit and they generally look like they have more structure. But when you look at the expected data, expected goals conceded per 90, they are 14th in the Premier League since Gerrard took over in game week 12. So whilst they do look better, according to the eye test, the data across those fixtures haven't been fantastic. What I would say, though, is that the fixtures haven't been particularly easy for Aston Villa and they've played a lot more games than some teams and therefore over a larger sample size, you would expect that potentially it could be lower than some of those teams that have only played six or seven games over that period. So there are a few things to know. I don't think that necessarily means that Aston Villa have a terrible defence, but what I would say is you are trusting that their defence will dr dramatically improve due to the nicer fixtures they've got coming up. Like I said, Leeds and Burnley games be rearranged, but also Everton, Leeds, Newcastle, Watford, Brighton, Southampton. From a defensive perspective, those are some incredible incredible fixtures. So you are almost, it is almost a bit of a leap of faith. And what I would say is don't buy into the narrative too much that Gerard has made them an incredible defensive unit. That isn't necessarily supported by the data, but they do look a little bit better. And I do expect them to further improve with these fixtures. If I were to choose between Cash and Dean, I think now, if I was forced to make the move this week, and I might be making the move this week, if they do have the double game week, I think I would go for Cash for now. I think that Luca Dean is nailed, but I think I don't think I'd be doing my job as a content creator without maybe just suggesting that it isn't definitely nailed and there could potentially be some rotation with Target. Let me know down below. Do you think that it will just be nailed at left back and it will play every game and that Target will only come on maybe in cup competitions or when he needs a rest maybe 80, 90 minutes into the game? Or do you think he will be rotating? There might be a big bit of rotation between them. And do you think that Matty Cash is the better option as a result? Considering how close the statistics are, I do think that I would just about lean to having Matty Cash, but I think they're both great options. If you doubled up on them, that could be an absolutely genius move. But again, you are taking a risk with the fact that the Aston Villa defence to date hasn't been that fantastic. So we have another Aston Villa player and it won't be the last Aston Villa player of the video either. But now we're moving on to the midfield. We've got two defenders, two midfielders, two attackers in today's video. The two midfielders are Coutinho versus Rafinha, the two Brazilians. Now, it's very, very difficult to do a statistical comparison between the two. I've got the stats on the screen, but I want to caveat just in case you go straight to looking at the stats. Coutinho has played 22 minutes in the Premier League and therefore I've only put them there so that you've got something on your screen. Please do not draw conclusions or trends from 22 minutes on a football pitch. There are so many reasons that that is an issue. We won't even go into them here now, but please don't draw too many conclusions, even though he did look fantastic when he came on from the bench. We've already discussed Aston Villa's fixtures and we've discussed their fixtures to be rescheduled. Obviously, that's the same from the discussion between Cash and Dean. What I wanted to note was Leeds fixtures coming up because there is a possibility, like I said, if the Leeds game is scheduled into 23, Aston Villa would have Everton away and Leeds away. Leeds would have Newcastle at home and Aston Villa at home. And therefore the difficulty, if that is the case and the Leeds game is pushed into 23, the difficult decision would be between Coutinho and Rafinha. Even if, as I said, they're single game weeks, that's still a difficult decision because over the six, I would probably say that Aston Villa's fixtures are slightly better. But that game week 23 fixture, Newcastle at home, then Villa away and Everton away, obviously not the best defensive data. You would say that they're pretty good fixtures for Rafinha as well. If you chuck in the possible Aston Villa double, it looks absolutely brilliant. So I would say that the thing with Rafinha, if you're looking at Rafinha's fixtures, is that the next three are all pretty good fixtures. 
However, game week 26, 27, and 28 aren't the best fixtures in the world. I'm not saying they're particularly difficult, but Man United at home, Tottenham at home, Leicester away. If you compare that to Coutinho, Watford away, Brighton at home, Southampton at home, I would prefer the Villa fixtures for sure. Also, the fact that they're, they would have either the Leeds or Burnley game as well to rearrange in there. I think, generally speaking, I do prefer Villa's fixtures. But over the next three, they're pretty good for Leeds. After game week 28, so from game 29 onwards... Leeds fixtures then turn for the better once again. So it's only that period between 26 and 28 that I don't particularly like Leeds fixtures. So I guess what I would say is if you're bringing them in this week, I wouldn't have any issue with going for Rafinha. I think if you miss the game at 23 fixture against Newcastle when they don't have a, the Aston Villa double rearranged anytime soon, Villa, Everton, United, Tottenham and Leicester as a five just does not compete with Leeds, Newcastle, Watford, Brighton, Southampton. So for me, if you miss this week and you're not bringing Rafinha in this week, I think I'd probably prefer to bring Coutinho in based on the fixtures. However, if you don't bring him in this week, it doesn't mean you can't bring him in at all. You could just then ride out with Coutinho until 28. And then in game week 29, you could make the switch from Coutinho back to Rafinha. And I do like that. So it doesn't mean that you have to keep one of these long term. You could just have maybe Coutinho for if they do have a double in 23, then Leeds, then Newcastle, then Watford. Then maybe switch out in around game week 28, game week 29 to Rafinha. That could be a fantastic tactic as well. If we look at Rafinha's underlying statistics... They're not mind-blowing, but they are sort of in line with what we saw last season in the Premier League in that he's very consistent. He seems to be allergic to double-digit hauls, which is slightly annoying with Rafinha that he doesn't ever seem to get those massive hauls. But he ticks along so nicely. His creativity in particular is incredible. And with Bamford coming back to full fitness, hopefully he can stay fit. That makes Rafinha an incredible option because he's finally got someone to aim for with a lot of those crosses, corners, free kicks, and a lot of those clever passes that he does. Even those cutbacks gets to the byline very well. So I think with Leeds strengthening, I do expect Rafinha's output to increase slightly. But what I would say is you're not bringing Rafinha in for those 15, 20 pointers. Yes, he has that in his locker. We've seen that, but he doesn't ever seem to quite deliver on that. So if you're looking at the underlying statistics as well, they are good, but they're not great. They are probably worth his £6.5 million pound price tag. If we look at the underlying statistics from Coutinho's first game, obviously they were mind-blowing. We're looking at an expected goal involvement of about three, which would never be sustained. It's never been sustained by any player in the history of the Premier League or the history of the world, really. But what that does show is that Coutinho is a massive goal threat and he is very creative as well. And in that short time on the pitch, we saw the goal and this is what he can achieve when he's in form. And I... As a, an FPL manager, I sometimes like to take a leap of faith before we see evidence that a player can do it because that's how you get those points. If you wait until Coutinho scores six goals in six games and then bring him in, he's already going to be close to 100% effective ownership. You're not going to gain very much from bringing him in then. So I think with the fixtures coming up, Everton, Leeds, Newcastle, Watford and a potential double or two, I think now might be the time to take that risk with Coutinho. And if that doesn't work out over the next four, five, six game weeks, after that, you can bring in Rafinha. Or you could potentially just bring in Rafinha because the fixtures largely don't matter for him. He ticks along pretty nicely, regardless of who he plays against. So for me, at this moment in time, I'd quite like both. And I do have a team structure which would allow, with a minus eight, me to get Coutinho and Rafinha. If they both have single game weeks, I think I would just about lean towards Coutinho. If one of them gets, the, if they both get the double game week, then that's a very, very difficult decision because as a double game week, I think I prefer for Rafinha, Newcastle at home and Aston Villa at home in comparison to Everton away and Leeds away. Just about, I think I prefer Rafinha's. And then that makes that a much trickier decision. So hopefully all of that's clear. I think this is really down to whether you want to take that leap of faith with Coutinho. Rafinha is certainly the safer player. The fixtures aren't too bad. The underlying statistics are pretty good as well. He might still be on penalties, even though Bamford's coming back. He's on a lot of free kicks and corners as well. There's just something quite exciting about Coutinho. And that little glimpse that we saw in those 22 minutes was absolutely fantastic. If he can keep that up with the fixtures now turning for the better, and he nails a place in that starting eleven. I think Coutinho could be a fantastic option. Let me know down below, who do you prefer out of Coutinho or Rafinha, or are you looking to get both as well? I did say there was a lot of Aston Villa players in this watch list. Now, the reason for that is, like I said, I do think that they are likely to get a double very soon, but even if they don't, they are the team with the best fixtures from an attacking perspective. If you look at the fantasy football fix ticker, and if you just look at the fixtures in general, if you just eyeball them, there is no team that can compete with these fixtures over the next six to eight weeks. And as a result, I do think that your transfers this week should probably prioritise it. Aston Villa players. And if you really don't want to bring them in for the Everton game, perhaps you do think there'll be a new manager bounce or you think Everton will do fairly well. From game week 24 onwards, the fixtures are just ridiculous. So even if they don't get that double game week, and even if you don't want to bring them in this week, I do think they should be higher on your priority list. And therefore, that's why they've dominated the discussion today. The final discussion 
is if you're going to bring in an Aston Villa striker, potentially maybe for a Watford striker, although that might not, you might not want to do that this week, or potentially West Ham play Manchester United this week if you want to take out um, Antonio because he hasn't been performing that well and you want to bring in Watkins or Ings, who do you go for? They are now both exactly the same price at 7.7 .7 million, so there's nothing to be said for the price. And with respect to ownership, they're fairly similar for ownership. Watkins has around a 4.5% higher ownership than Danny Ings. So it's pretty equal. Obviously, the same fixtures, same price, relatively similar ownership. So it really does come down to the underlying statistics. And also, how nailed do you think they are in the team? Now, let's start with the formation and who I think will be nailed in the team. What I would say is that I think their first choice striker is Ollie Watkins. Now, this is just my opinion. I have spoke to a few Villa fans to confirm some of this. They generally hold the same opinion as me, but it's not always the same. I think Ollie Watkins, if they have to play one striker, I do think that Watkins is their first choice striker. However, due to the fact that Watkins can play on the right and left wing, I think if Danny Ings is fit, there is a possibility that Danny Ings will start as the nine and Ollie Watkins will probably play on the right wing with Coutinho on the left wing. So if you imagine a 4-3-3 formation with Louise, McGinn, maybe Ramsey in midfield, and then probably Watkins, Ings, and Coutinho on the left, I think that's probably their best six attackers that they can field. The issue that you then run into, well, what about Buendia? You could potentially put Buendia in the midfield and play like a 4-2-3-1. That would allow you to get Watkins, Ings, Buendia, and Coutinho in the team. But then you are sacrificing the midfield a little bit. If that is the case, then they can play all of the all of the attackers. However, if that's not the case, what you then, I think, have is Watkins and Coutinho will be fairly nailed in that Villa side. I think they are probably the two first-choice attackers. Otherwise, why would they have brought Coutinho in? And obviously, Watkins is the Villa darling. And I think then you've got a straight shootout between Danny Ings, and Buendia. Now, I think that Watkins is more effective up top, and I do think Buendia is a tidy little player. Also, if you bring in the likes of Bailey as well when he's back fit, it does become a bit of an issue with the amount of attackers they have potentially to their disposal. So I think for the time being, I think that Ings and Watkins will both start, but immediately what puts me off of Ings ever so slightly is just the fact that I do think that Watkins is the more nailed. And I think if Buendia starts to play well and they get some of their other attackers back in the team, I do think that Ings could potentially be rotated. If you bring into account the fact that he's quite injury prone as well, that's another reason potentially to favour Ings. Uh, to favour Watkins, I should say. If we have a look at the underlying statistics, they've both played quite a few minutes this season. Projected points over the next six game weeks is actually in favor of Danny Ings according to the fantasy football fix algorithm. That might be due to the fact that Danny Ings is probably going to be on penalties, specifically with the fact that El Ghazi is now left as well. That might make you lean towards Danny Ings, the addition of penalties. Expected FPL points per 90 over the first 22 game weeks. Again, Danny Ings does come out on top there. So at the moment, you would say Danny Ings does look the better of the two players. However, when we get into looking at the actual underlying statistics, I do think that I do favor Ollie Watkins. Their non-penalty expected goals and expected assists over the first 22 game weeks. Ollie Watkins, I wouldn't say is terrible. It's pretty average for a strike. It was the same as Rafinha's at 0.40. If you take into account the fact that Rafinha is a 6.5 million pound midfielder, I would say that Ollie Watkins 0.40 non-penalty expected goals and expected assists is actually fairly subpar and I'm not that impressed by it. But when he plays 90 minutes every game and he does get quite a lot of opportunities, the fact that the fixtures are now turning for the better, and this is where you would expect him to do quite well in this run, I don't mind that. What I do mind is Danny Ings 0.17 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90. Obviously, when you take put penalties back into it, and he has had a couple, that does make it a slightly better underlying statistic. But generally speaking, his expected data is very poor. 0.17 is one of the worst in the Premier League for strikers this season. So yes, Danny Ings is clinical. Yes, he's probably going to be on penalties. But no, his underlying statistics are not fantastic. Big chances per 90 as well. Ollie Watkins is over double Danny Ings. 0 0.5 big chances per 90 for Watkins. 0 0.24 big chances for Danny Ings. And that takes into account penalties as well. So not getting many big chances at all in that Aston Villa side. And then touches in the box. They're both pretty impressive. Ollie Watkins at 5.52 is very, very good. And 5.01 for Danny Ings is also very good. We know he's a fox in the box. We know most of his touches will come in the box. But the fact that Ollie Watkins is still getting more touches in the box for me is pretty impressive. So I guess the point of doing this was probably to say, in my opinion, I wouldn't try to get too clever with this and select Danny Ings. Yes, he's on penalties. And yes, he does tend to take the big chances when he gets them. But I don't think he's 100% nailed in that side, especially if they play a 4-3-3, which I do think there is a high chance they could do. And then I think Buendia could be on the right 
Coutinho on the left and Watkins up top. And also the underlying statistics just aren't great for Danny Ings and the injury record as well. So for me, there are too many reasons to not suggest Danny Ings. And therefore, if I was to bring in a striker this week, it would be Ollie Watkins. If you're not making the move this week, of course, assess it over the next few weeks. What formation are they playing? Is it Buendia or Danny Ings being favoured? All of these things can come into account. If they play a 4-2-3-1 and Ollie Watkins is playing sort of a left attacking mid and you've got Danny Ings up top as the sole striker, that could potentially mean that you want to go for Danny Ings. Maybe Watkins' output on that left wing just isn't as impressive. So these are all things to monitor. But if you're making the move this week, I think it's got to be Ollie Watkins for me. Let, let me know down below. Do you like Ollie Watkins or do you think you want to just maybe take the risk with Ings? I just don't think it's worth it, in my opinion. So guys, there you have it. Those are my top transfer targets ahead of possibly double game week 23. But if not, it will be a single game week. And I still think that all six of those players, five Aston Villa players, will be good signings for game week 23 and beyond. Let me know down below. Are there any players that you think I've potentially missed off? Any players that you are looking at bringing in for this week? I'm always interested to hear what your possible transfer plans are as well. If you're enjoying the content here on this channel, please do remember to like, comment and subscribe. It's completely free for you guys to do, but we appreciate the support so very much. And it really helps to show the channel to other people and allow us to improve our reach. And in doing so, help more people with the content that we provide. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, guys. Cheers. Bye-bye.